I see you all to our program on October 24th at 7 p.m. here in this room. Um, the a professor from the political science department, Professor Peterson, is going to be coming in and he's going to be teaching us about how political polling works. So that when you read about polls in the newspaper or hear about them on TV, you understand what they can and cannot tell us. So I hope you will join us on October 24th as well. So without sure, it, yeah. <laughs> so without, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first expert, Kate from the Iowa State Libraries. I set a timer here so I don't go over time. All right. So in my role at the library, I am in charge of the uh, required class for all of our undergraduates about introduction to college level research. And there's a particular set of um, skills that we teach them. And one of the tricks or tips that we uh, go into is called SIFT. And so I'm gonna go into that method with you today using a specific example of one time when I forgot to use it and uh, tell you a little story about that to help you understand how you might be able to use this when you are fact-checking something. Let me make this full screen. Oh, there I see, full screen mode. There we go. But first, I need to introduce you to my son, Owen. Um, any excuse to show cute baby pictures, right? <laughs> Um, so Owen was born here in Ames and I had decided to breastfeed him. And for me, that meant a lot of sleep deprivation and multiple nursing sessions during the nighttime. So I felt most comfortable nursing while using this pillow called a boppy pillow on the side of my bed. So that's how I was asked, I, that's how I was comfortable. But uh, that meant I couldn't fall asleep <laughs> while I was nursing. And so in order to keep myself awake, I would often go through my phone and scroll through my news feed at two, three, four in the morning. Um, so this is to give you some context as to where where I was mentally uh, for this story. Because one night when Owen was about one month old, I came upon this article at about two or three in the morning. And I should say, Owen is alive and healthy, happy, all that. Just because it's about SIDS. So... So I came upon this article and SIDS, I had a lot of anxiety and some depression after my son was born. And so that really hit me hard seeing this kind of an article here because I was terrified of my son dying of SIDS. So, and I felt the same way for his siblings. But uh, given this context, I can imagine you might know how I felt when I saw this article. Um, how does it make you all feel? SIDS is scary, but reading world first breakthrough could prevent SIDS. How do you feel about that? You feel a little hopeful, right? Like, oh my God, yes, please tell me more. So I, when I read this, I was really ecstatic and I immediately shared it with my husband who was sleeping, just sent it, which I shouldn't have done. And I broke one of the first steps that I'm gonna talk to you about. Um, so let's go into the steps for this SIFT method and show you where I went wrong and what I should have done. So SIFT stands for stop, investigate, find, and trace. Now the stop, when I'm talking with my students, it's stop and ask yourself, are you on task? When you're in your normal life, that might not be as relevant, but it's also the second part that's more important, which is stop. Am I being emotionally pulled or triggered by what I'm reading? The I is for investigate the source. You need to determine, is this credible? Is this an actual information source? The F is for finding better coverage, where you need to think, is there a better article out there that's talking about this? Or some more credible or reliable or well-established sources that are saying the same thing? And then trace it back is, tracing back this story or this claim to the original context so that you can decide what was taken out of context or what was true. So for stop, 
I did not stop and say, is this emotionally pulling me? Because it sure was. <laughs> um, when I read the article, you can see in these red boxes here, I've highlighted some of the wording that they use in here that was just really over the top kind of wording. And if you see this kind of wording in some of the sources that you're looking at, that should be an immediate warning sign, particularly if it appeals to your sense of anger or your sense of disgust or um, fear, because those are often ones that are pointed towards or, or targeted because that will help things spread faster. They have studies about how something that's horrible news will spread much faster than something that's wonderful news. So some of these, you know, it's changing the narrative around SIDS. Families can now live with the knowledge that it wasn't their fault. These are really big claims, really emotional claims. The I for investigate the source, we often tell our students that there's a couple different ways they can do this. Um, one is the Wikipedia trick. You type in the, um, the person or the organization behind this article, and then you follow that with the word Wikipedia. And sometimes you might find out that, oh, this is an organization that was founded by a Ku Klux Klan member, or, oh, this is well known to be a really junk website. Other times you might get nothing if it's something brand new. And we'll sometimes caution our students that if it's not well established, that's not necessarily a red flag, but it's also not a green flag yet either. They haven't been around long enough to establish a reliable or credible um, reputation. So in thinking about that, some things I could have done was look up the Sydney Children's Hospital Network, it is real. It is credible. They do great work. Um, this was a .gov website for in Australia. So typically all signs of good things. And they mentioned that this, this claim came from the Lancet's e-biomedicine. So they're providing some evidence, which is all, again, pretty good signs. You can also investigate the author of the source or the person that they're talking about to see if that's an accurate representation of that person. Uh, Dr. Carmel Harrington is the researcher from the article that they're referencing and the person that they're talking about uh, who started the foundation that paid for this research. And she does have a background in sleep and um, credentials behind that. Now the F, for finding better coverage is basically asking, so you're saying this, but what are other people saying about this? What are other people on the internet or other peer institutions, are they saying the same thing? If they're saying the same thing, that lends more credibility to a claim. If they are not saying the same thing, then you might need to approach that with more caution. Um, so in order to do this, you just do a simple Google search sometimes. For this one, I just did the Google search of SIDS study Australia. And this was the results screen that I came up with. And just screening some of those headlines, you can see that there is not a consensus on the results of this study. Um, so Australian sudden infant death syndrome study, not a clue, not something else. No, that study didn't find the cause of SIDS. Um, possible biomarker, clues as to why some babies die. These words are a lot more cautious than the words that were used in that press release from the Children's Hospital. Um, you can also use your tried and true fact-checking websites if it's, depending on the claim, it depends on the context of the claim. If it's a political claim or something about legislation, those sites are going to have more information specific to that. But doing something, just a simple Google search about what are people, what is everybody saying about this claim can give you some information about the consensus around it. So <clears throat> I, like I said, I didn't have to go really deep into some of these articles to find out what some of the problems might've been with this original source that I saw. Um, I made these bigger so that you could see them because they were kind of small on that list. But again, here's, um, this is from the US to US. USA Today uh, fact-checking, and their fact-checking organization did have one about this uh, particular resource. 
So their overall rating and summarization was that the findings were premature and not conclusive enough to label them as a discovery of a specific cause for SIDS. And if you if you did choose to read down some of those articles, you would see that repeated. So that's the majority consensus. And that's something to keep in mind when you're evaluating the claims. If a lot of people are saying the opposite, maybe that claim in the original source was wrong. So they were overblown. It's preliminary. It's good research, but preliminary. So when you look at sources, they're not always going to be 100% this is awesome, this is trash. They're going to be an, a, a, a gradient of good and bad. This one, the wording was overblown. The marketing people got carried away. But if you do the last part of SIFT, tracing it back to the original source or the original context, which in this case is the original study, then you find in here, what did they do? What was their methodology? What were some of the potential flaws or limitations of the study? Do they mention them in this article? And you can tell from there, yeah, they did. They said it's preliminary. They said, here are some of the drawbacks of what we did. We used dried blood samples, not fresh blood samples, and a whole bunch of other things. So that is the uh, summation of what we focus our students on when we're showing them how to approach things, specifically things on the open web when they're looking for items to use in their college level research. And I would just like to end with um, a little joke because <laughs> it's kind of crass. But in my opinion, I, I like to tell my students that I think bias is a lot like farting. Um, I think it's like farting because everybody is guilty of it to some degree. And it can vary in the amount and in the severity. Dealing with it in small quantities is just a fact of life, uh, but in large quantities, it is unacceptable. And finally, some people are willing to acknowledge their own bias or their own farts um, and their own role in its creation, but others would rather ignore it. And how you respond to your bias or how you accept and own your bias can tell you a lot about the reliability of a source as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Kate. All right. So that's a good overview of like the basic process that you should go through with every source that you're looking at. But I want to go into a little bit more detail in when you're looking at a news website, like how do you tell whether it's reliable or not? What red or green flags do you look for to tell you whether or not a source is reliable? And like Kate said, it is kind of a gradient. No, there's no one thing that will say this is reliable or this isn't. It's more of a, an accumulation of red or green flags that are going to tell you whether or not you can probably trust a source or whether you probably can't. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to use a few examples, starting with the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal has a very long reputation for reliability. It was founded in 1889 and is one of three newspapers of record, which is one of the three newspapers in the United States that are considered the most reliable. If they reported it, it probably happened. So I'm going to, yeah. the other two are the Washington Post and the New York Times. Um, I picked this one because it's an, it, it's really, really easy to see the green flags that I'm going to point out on this site in particular. And so that made it a good example for this demonstration. So when you're looking for, for information on a news website, um, 
you're not looking necessarily at the context of the articles themselves or the the actual content of the articles themselves so much as the context what the librarians would call the metadata around them that's going to tell you a lot about reliability so to start with you're seeing you see here that there are a lot of headlines on this front page and most of the the headlines are fairly let's all right let's call it boring <laughs> like they're not trying to tug on your emotions right they're just trying to state what the article's about that's a green flag and when you click on an individual article you see right at the top the byline that is, the journalists who wrote the article, the date, the time it was posted. That is a green flag as well. When you start scanning through the article, you're going to see quotes. And all of the quotes should be attributed. So the NWS. Uh, let's see, where's another quote? Uh, Kathy Perkins, who is the director of emergency management, she said, whatever. They're attributing the information and they're telling you where they got it. And I'm sure Sherry would be happy to confirm for me that journalists actually really hate anonymous sources. They try not to use them whenever possible. Um, yes, occasionally you'll see anonymous sources in stories, especially about um, particularly concerning things that the government does, um, that happens. News, newspapers that are credible try not to use them. And when they do use them, a good reliable source is going to have a very strict policy about what that looks like. And that's a green flag. Uh, other green flags when you're looking at an article are that the photos that accompany each article are relevant to the article in question and are attributed to a specific photojournalist, which you can see here. This particular photo was taken by Ricardo Arduengo, and he actually doesn't even work for the Wall Street Journal. They got it from Reuters. And that's fine, but they're attributing it. That's a green flag. Um, then when you go back out and look at the main page, you can see that there's a bunch of different articles. And when you start clicking on different articles, you'll see that each one, again, has a byline. And, and the bylines are different. That's an indication of a large, active, well-funded newsroom in which the journalists are able to develop areas of expertise and, and develop a depth of knowledge about a topic, which, again, is a green flag. Other green flags that you can see just by scanning the headlines are here on the side. The opinion columns are clearly labeled as opinion. They're separate from the rest of the page so that there's no way to confuse an opinion column from a news article. That's a big green flag. Now, when you're looking at websites in general, websites kind of have a um, dress code, shall we say. It's kind of like the rules of business casual. Everybody kind of puts their own spin on it, but there are, there are certain kind of themes that you can see. And one of those things is that information about the institution, about the organization, is almost always going to be in one of three places. You'll, you'll see menus across the top, usually. Sometimes there will be a menu button in the upper right-hand corner the upper left-hand corner, or most commonly, as we see here, all the way down at the bottom. And this is where you can find on almost every single website 
information about the institution that is publishing these articles. And this is where we're going to go to look for the rest of our green flags. Specifically, the Wall Street Journal has a very clear policy about corrections. And they clearly label when an article has been corrected. Big green flag. That tells you that they're trying very hard to be reliable. Additionally, they also very clearly post in this bottom about section information about themselves as an institution. They're very, very clear about who's, on, who's in their newsroom, who's their reporters, who are their editors, who are the executives that run the company, who owns the Wall Street Journal. They're very upfront about all of that. And as you can tell by the way they keep trying to sell me a subscription, they get the majority of their funding by selling subscriptions which means that's where their funding priorities lie. And because they have a long reputation for reliability, that's what their subscribers and advertisers expect. They expect the Wall Street Journal to be reliable and they will pull their articles or their subscriptions if the Wall Street Journal fails to be reliable. So they have a very strong financial incentive to remain reliable. That's a green flag. Additionally, they also have a very clear post about their newsroom standards and ethics. Now, just because somebody says that they're ethical doesn't mean that they're ethical, of course, but posting their policies clearly in a way that's easy to find is a really big green flag because it helps their readers, their subscribers, their advertisers hold the newsroom accountable. So that's how we can tell that the Wall Street Journal does in fact deserve its reputation for reliability. They are a reliable source and they have all of these green flags that tell us so. Now, does that mean that they're never going to get anything wrong? No, of course not. They're human just like the rest of us. But when the Wall Street Journal says something happened, we can probably rely on it. Okay, so. Those are green flags to look for. How about some red flags? I'd like to welcome you all to Ames, Iowa's very own Pink Slime Journalism site. What is Pink Slime Journalism? Pink Slime Journalism is a term that has popped up recently for local or hyper-local news sources that claim to be journalism but aren't. Um, they're often extremely politically biased and very, very unreliable. So what are some of the, the red flags that we can see on this site? First of all, uh, we can see that there's no byline. They don't list a reporter's name. It is dated, but not all of these articles are dated recently. Like this one is from weeks ago. Plus the photos that accompany each article are very clearly scraped from a government website somewhere and don't have anything to do with the article in question. Huge red flag. And when we start looking through their different sections. They're really interested in cheap gas and they're repeating the articles over and over and over again. Almost all of these pages have the same basic articles on them, the same basic data, because they're trying to make it look like they have more content than they actually do. Big red flag. Additionally, when we start to do a little bit more research, and dig into their about section, which I would note is kind of hard to reach because every time I scroll down to the bottom, they load more stuff on me. So it doesn't give me a whole lot of time to click on their about link. 
But when you do that, you discover that they're owned by a company called Metric Media. Metric Media, unlike the Wall Street Journal, is not a for-profit company. It is, in fact, a 501c3. This by itself is not necessarily a red flag. 501c3s are not permitted by law to directly do um, campaigning for candidates. But it also means that they don't necessarily have to disclose their donors. And that's what they're doing. They're not showing where the funding is coming from. Big red flag. Additionally, when we start to research this company, and by research, I mean a basic Google search, um, we, would, we will find that there are multiple credible reports of bias and pink slime journalism. Um, so that's a big red flag as well. Mm -hmm. The company that owns the news site has been accused of bias. Additionally, when we go down and look at how to become a reporter, this is their application. The whole thing. This is it. That's it. That is a huge, ginormous red flag. They're not recruiting reporters or journalists so much as people to pump out random content. So that is an example of a site with just about every red flag that I can think of. I wouldn't necessarily disbelieve this site if they told me that the sky was blue, but I'd definitely want to get some more sources to back them up. So now let's take a look at something not quite so cut and dry. The Iowa Capitol Dispatch um, has some green flags and some red flags. They do list bylines, which is good. That's a green flag. The articles that we can see are dated and they're dated recently. So the site is kept up to date. The photos are relevant to the articles in question and are attributed. So when we, when we click on one, they will tell us where they got the photo. That's a green flag. Additionally, just like the Wall Street Journal, when we go all the way down to their bottom, uh, oh wait, they don't keep theirs at the bottom. Yes, they do. Okay, sorry, right here. When we go all the way down to the bottom, they, they give us their ethics policy. Uh, again, that's a green flag that helps us hold them accountable. And if you read through it and start comparing it to the one on the Wall Street Journal website, you'll notice that they're actually quite similar, which is great. That's a green flag. So they also they will also allow us to investigate their institutional affiliations. In this case, the Iowa Capitol Dispatch is owned by State's Newsroom. And State's Newsroom is also a 501c3. However, unlike uh, metric media, the State's Newsroom is listing their funders. Where did that go? Yes, here we are, partnerships. So they're listing their funders, all of their funders, all of their affiliations, all of their partnerships. And even when you start really digging down into the depths of the state newsroom website, you can even find their official tax filings. They have made them public. So that's why I say that being a 501c3 isn't necessarily by itself a red flag. If the organization in question chooses to be transparent about its partnerships, its donors, its funders, that can actually be a green flag. But it really depends on the organization. 
However, there are a few red flags that I note about the Iowa Capitol dispatch. When you start scanning through, you'll notice that the bylines are actually repeated fairly frequently. It's a small newsroom. They only have a few journalists, and they're basically the journalistic equivalent of a startup, which is a little bit of a red flag because there's no history there. Uh, there's no um, long reputation of reliability that gives them a real financial incentive to stay reliable the way the Wall Street Journal has. The other thing that I had trouble finding on this website is a corrections policy. I was able to find their ethics policy very easily, but I didn't find what they do about corrections very easily, and that's a bit of a red flag as well. Additionally, when I start Googling State's newsroom, I find that they have also been credibly accused of bias, which means that if I was looking at one of these articles and considering whether or not to share it, I'd maybe find out and see whether it showed up in the Des Moines Register or KCCI or other local news organizations as well. If it was, maybe I'd go ahead and share the article. But if it wasn't, I might think twice. And so those are kind of the red and green flags that you would look for when you're doing the investigate and find steps that Kate was talking about. All right, thank you. All right, Sherry. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about trust in the media. Oh, and my fonts are not showing quite right. Um, so where I'm going to step to the side to start out just a little bit. Where do people actually get their news from? Uh, we have an institution called the, the Pew Research Center, and they they are known for their objective studies that they do, surveys, things like that. A recent study that they did this summer, actually, uh, about news platform preferences shows us that about 58% of adults 18 and up are getting their news from digital sources, okay? 58%, over half, moving in on two thirds of people are actually getting their, their news, their primary news source is online. Um, this means that it becomes that much more important to make sure that we are only getting our information from credible sources. But there are a lot of sources out there. So how do I choose what I want to take a look at? Is there a down of those? Because if I'm accessing the Washington Post or the New York Times digitally, yes, that's you know the same as absolutely so there is a a website it's ad fontes media um this is a public benefit corporation in colorado and by public benefit corporation what that means is that yes they are for profit but they have a stated public mission to rate all news um ad fontes is latin for to the source which is their goal. They want to make sure that people are able to understand their sources that they're working with. They have developed a uh, media bias chart. Um, on the next slide, I will show you the static one, but they also have an interactive media bias chart. They keep this up to date. And what it does, it looks at um, news value and reliability, and it charts that against political bias in both directions, okay? Uh, they openly talk about their methodology on their website. They, they don't try to hide any of that. They talk about their team. Uh, they even have a video that talks about how they make these, these judgments. Um, they also have information on their website about... I have it on Do Not Disturb, too. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my phone is going off over there. Um, they even have information on identifying and mitigating our own bias. It, if anybody asks them if they if they are biased, yes, 
they will openly admit that they are because people by nature have bias. And so then they talk about what steps they take to get around that. Okay. So this is what the the media chart looks like. And on here, it's really cluttered. But if you look at it on the website, if you look at their interactive one, you can actually search for individual news organizations. You can narrow it, you can filter it and only look at print, you know, websites or articles. You could look at uh, podcasts and audio. You could filter it by TV and video and get more information on where these different news organizations and podcasts and everything else, where they lie. Okay. All right. So now thinking back to that 58%, let's dig just a little bit deeper on that. Okay. Since 2020, um, we have seen a decline in the number of people who are actually going to news websites to get their news. It's dropped by 3%. Okay. During that same time period, though, the percentage of people who get their information, their news information from so social media has increased by 7%. And so this tells us that while, yes, we are looking for people who have you know, organizations that have this, this long history, very important, but most people aren't actually going there to get their news. They're getting their news from some of the websites, but they're getting it from TikTok. They're getting it from Facebook and Instagram and all of that. So if we take a little bit more of a look at even that part, there are currently 224 million U.S. adults who are voter eligible this year. Okay. Out of that, if we start breaking things down, um, about 48% of all Facebook users, that would be about 91 million people are getting, that's where they're getting their news from is Facebook. Um, with Instagram, about 69 million people are getting their news from Instagram. Uh, 63 million get it from TikTok and 63 million get it from X, which used to be known as Twitter. Now, it's also important to note that these are not exclusive and that people might be getting their news from multiple, okay? Um, and one of the problems that we see whoops, with social media is that we wind up with these echo chambers. So the more you start seeing certain stories, um, the more those types of stories are going to be shown to you. All right, so let's take a look at what happens when we get our news from social media. There we go. So has anybody heard about Tim Walz's middle finger? Okay. Um, at the September 29th, Michigan, Minnesota game, Tim Waltz is being accused of flipping off a student who yelled Trump 2024 baby. Okay. Um, and if we take a look at stills from this, we have two different versions. We have a low resolution and we have a higher resolution. These are stills that were taken from the video. And the lower quality one is the one that really circulated from this. And everybody is saying, wow, look at that. I mean, that is a lack of class. That's a lack of respect, all of this. But when you start looking at the higher quality, you can actually start to see the separation between his thumb and his finger. I mean, it's still a, a low resolution image. But there was another picture that was literally taken about a second after the previous one where you can see he is very clearly pointing at people in the crowd. And in fact, uh, they believe that on the left side here, the the guy in the yellow slicker, it's believed that he's actually the one who took that video that shows him supposedly flipping off the crowd, okay? So we don't have a lot of context and people can spin things the way they want, okay? So what about um, standards when it comes to social media? Not all social media platforms list what their standards are, okay? Um, I am going to pick on X, picking on that one in particular, um, because of its relevance to some of the other things that I'm going to talk about. Now, 
for for Twitter for X, um, there is the coveted blue check mark. You know that is that is your verified. That lets people know that you have passed some kind of check to make sure that you are an authority. But when we go in and we actually look, the very first thing that we see is that only accounts that are subscribed to their premium membership are allowed to have the blue check mark. That is concerning because now you're paying to have people think that you are an authority. And when we read down even further, one of their conditions is that the sites have to be non-dece non-deceptive and that your account has no signs of being misleading or deceptive. And at the very bottom, it even goes so far as to say that they will have a team who will review this, okay? So let's take a look at what these blue checkmark verified websites, what some of them are actually doing, okay? By now we've all heard about poor Springfield and the pet situation there right? Um, this started with a woman who posted to her local Facebook group, her community Facebook group, and it took off from there. Um, on the left here, we have the original post in here, and we start to see that we're getting some comments. Um, for instance, we have some a user who goes by End Wokeness, who, you know, asserts that, yes, this is true. Is it though? I mean, if we start looking at usernames, am I really going to believe somebody called End Wokeness? I mean, they, yes, they have a blue check mark, but is this something that I should really believe? And so looking at usernames when it comes to online, it becomes very important. Okay. So End Wokeness, yeah, might want to really think about that one. But what if the username was blue is true? or Real Patriot 97. Or even worse, what if the username is a deliberate misspelling of a valid user or website? PolitiFact, for instance. Um, out of Duke University, they are known, they've won Pulitzers for their work in fact-checking. But if there was a user who called themselves PolitiFacts, they could say whatever they want and ride on that reputation that PolitiFact has put together. So we want to be very cautious when we look at usernames. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of rethinking whether this is true or not, but then I look at this next comment. I live close by. This is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now we've gotten as another assertion from somebody else. So, okay, how do I, how do I decide? Let's take a look at the original post. All right, red flag number one, the person who posted it heard something from someone else who that happened to somebody else that this person knows, okay? If you start counting, the original poster is four times removed from the alleged event. That is something to be really concerned about. If we don't have somewhere that we can actually trace it back to, you should treat it with a healthy dose of skepticism. Um, red flag number two is that a community post was picked up and posted publicly, and that's where our usernames come in, okay? So usually community posts, I mean, I'm sure some of you on here are part of the Ames People Group or Nextdoor or something like that. And I mean, things on there should probably be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt, right? But when, when, if we had one of our posts, one of our community posts that was suddenly being splashed all over uh, the national media, that's something that we should be really concerned about. Okay. All right. So if we're looking at these, what kind of reach can these blue check mark accounts really have? Well, they can have quite a reach. For instance, this was picked up the same story different picture was picked up by another X account, the Calvin Coolidge project. Okay. Now this one has over 700,000 people who have viewed it. And, uh, but it only has like 1.5 or 1.5, 1500 um, shares. 
Okay, so it hasn't been shared very widely. But this account, the House Judiciary GOP, that has 87 million views and several thousand shares. Okay. Um, note both of these have the blue flat or the blue check marks. I'm getting really irritated with my phone. Um, could you? Sorry, my my phone doesn't always respect do not disturb or being flipped upside down. So um it just it's problematic. Okay. Okay, we'll see if that does it. All right, so let's take a, li a little bit closer look at these accounts. Yes. So if we take a deeper look at the Calvin, the Calvin Coolidge project, okay, first of all, this is somebody who has themselves classified as media and news. Okay, uh, bringing you the latest breaking news so that you can stay informed on current events. Using photos of a former U.S. president, Calvin Coolidge, to try to lend legitimacy. Okay, they have 72,000 followers, 40,000 posts. Okay, not a huge, huge reach, but the fact that they're calling themselves media and news is concerning. What's even more concerning, though, is when we look at the House Judiciary GOP, again with the blue check mark, yes, this is the actual House Judiciary account. Um, now, they're not posting the actual story. What they're doing is they're posting memes, which I would argue is even worse because memes will get shared even more readily than stories will. And this is not the only one that they that they have shared. And this particular meme, like I said, 87 million uh, views and almost 10,000 shares. Okay. And then they have almost half a million followers who are getting this. And they're not just posting it to X. They have these same things on their Facebook as well. So they are really extending their reach. All right, but I mean, these aren't people that we know, right? And so does it really affect us that much? Well, misinformation does because we have social media accounts and we have people on there who also post misinformation. Not all misinformation is malicious, okay? I'm sure that some of you have seen or even posted something very similar to this. Um, the warning that, Facebook, Meta is going to start using your photos without your permission, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, this is false. This claim has been around since November 2012. Before there was a Meta, when it was just Facebook, this was circulating. Um, it has hit Instagram. It has hit Snapchat. It has hit other social media sites with the same claim. Now, there is no way that any of these organizations can actually go back and retroactively uh, make adjustments to the privacy policy that we all agreed to when we signed up for accounts, okay? Our information, we're putting it out there, okay? Um, so this is something that I know it makes us feel better to put this out, but it is absolutely untrue, okay? We also have friends, though, some of us, who post things that are not quite so innocuous. And both of these have actually come from, I, I personally know the people that posted both of these, and I interact with them in real life, okay? Um, so the second one, this one has picked up some false information that is floating around about uh, Representative Ilhan Omar. Okay, Democratic representative from Minnesota. In this case, this is about her daughter who supposedly has a very long criminal history. And this is supposedly a photo of her that is a mugshot without her headscarf on. Okay, 
Now, notice Facebook went ahead and fact-checked this, obscured the image just right off the bat, saying that this has been fact-checked and this is an altered photo. Okay, so good for Facebook for doing things like that. This particular individual didn't exactly handle it well uh, because his immediate response was, dear Failbook, since you attest to this being an altered photo, please show the original unaltered photo. This is the type of corporate scumbaggery that I'm going to bring up in civil court, blah, blah, blah. And Facebook also included beneath that, that this is a doctored image of a man in South Wales that gets circulated with the story that it is Omar's daughter. Okay. So my, my friend's response here is actually two more red flags. Okay. First, the fact that he has been fact-checked has him immediately start starting to threaten litigation for being fact-checked. Okay. And then he delves into name calling. Okay. So it's not a, oh, let me take a look. It's immediately trying to find ways to fault the person fact checking. All right. Do I fact check him? I absolutely do. Okay. Uh, so what can we do when we have friends and family that we need to fact check? And a lot of times they're posting things that are that they have seen in the news, whatever their news source is. Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to identify what type of erroneous information it is, because that'll help you with your response. Is it disinformation, which requires an intent to deceive people? Or is it misinformation, where they just might not know that the information is false? Okay, ask yourself that. And then fact check first, engage later. Make sure you do your research, your homework before you try to engage with them. Respond with care. Um, you can actually amplify a false message if you call it out without having the proper facts supporting you. Use empathy. Nobody likes having their mistakes pointed out. Nobody likes being called out. So try to do so in a very, very supportive way. Avoid escalating. Okay. Defensiveness. Once people get defensive, they are digging their heels in. They are not budging. They are going to double down on whatever it is they are asserting. Um, sometimes it's easier and better just to walk away than it is to try to keep the argument going and provide resources, share fact-checking websites. Uh, there are a lot of them out there. There's Snopes and, again, PolitiFact. Um, share these websites with, with them so that they can look these up for themselves. But they quite often don't believe them. But they often don't believe them, yes. Uh, so what can we do as people who are on social media ourselves? Never share a post without fact-checking it yourself. Look for sources and look for multiple reliable sources. So same things that we've heard when it comes to the news. Consider the agenda. You know, what is the reason somebody is posting this? Does it have to do with politics? Does it have to do with money? Okay. These are big things that will really polarize people and it, they're meant to polarize people. And then um, again, view stories that play to your emotions with a lot of caution because those are deliberately there to try to get you to respond. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we have a little time now for questions. Um, so some, my trusty intern is going to bring forward a microphone and if you have a question, if you would just speak it into the microphone and then we will do our best to answer. I have a question. Oh, they think they want to get it out. Okay. Thank you. This is something that you shared uh, earlier when you had all the different sources posted as maybe to the left or to the right and the media center. 
Where do you go for that? So that was actually, the website is called Ad Fontes. Oh, okay, that went with that. Okay. Yep, that went with that. And that's the media bias chart. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is the whole site free? Like when I've is the whole site free? Is there, uh, it seems like when I've looked at it before, there might be a, maybe a pay comp, you know, part of it. Um, there is a pay part and that they come right out and tell you yeah. that yes, they are for profit um, and they do sell services. However, you can download the static media bias chart for free and you can use the interactive one for free. So they're not restricting that. They have other other things that they're selling. This is a broader question. I think it's more philosophy than question, but I'm a former high school teacher. I think a lot about, um, and I actually saw a really interesting story about, I think it was Norway, maybe it was Denmark, and teaching even like elementary school kids to start, you know, being critical about what they're looking at um, online and um, and just resources in general and and. Um, it seems to me that part of our failing in education is that people are not trusting. They, they yeah, people don't know what to trust. So how, how do we, I don't know. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about, you know, what you're doing at the college level, but in, in some ways this needs to start a lot earlier. And do you know of it? Maybe, I don't know, maybe do you know of, of people trying to do that, um, yeah. Well, so I've noticed I teach two different sections of the course. One is to honor students and the, the others are all just the regular students. And both groups come back sometimes and say, I learned all of this in high school. So I think there's some that's trying to be introduced and pushed uh, in high school level, but I'm not sure it's any earlier than that. I don't know middle school or, or, um, elementary. But as far as like what to believe, we still try and really push what is the evidence and can you follow that train of evidence? So it's it's like you say, though, you, you can only go so far if someone's not willing to believe the evidence that's in front of their face. That we we try and explain that or help our students deal with that by talking about the different cognitive biases that play into what they're doing and what they're doing in their personal lives with like the backfire effect you had mentioned if something goes against my beliefs my core beliefs i will dig in and i if you tell me no i say yes and so we talk about trying to examine as a student what are your core beliefs how might they be affecting this? And look at that in others. Ask what are your core beliefs that you feel are being attacked and try and empathize first before correcting. That's all I got for that. And I, oh, I was gonna say, I can chime in on that a little bit as well. Um, there is a definite lack of media and information literacy. And I know for a fact that um, there is a course that's being proposed at the undergraduate level um, at Iowa State that will teach media and information literacy within a global context. So um, trying to make sure that everybody has that ability to gain that media literacy. This would be. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is being recorded, right? So this would be required maybe of all undergraduates or? Um, it, if everything goes as planned, it will be a general education require or yeah. a, option that people can take as part of their core education. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, what you're teaching, I, I think is our, our kids see it sometimes as well. I only need to use this when I'm writing a paper. And I think what I'm getting at is, which is good, at least they have that, but how do you use it every day? You know, when you're flipping through Facebook and, you know, and so, and so that's good. Yeah. 
And that's sort of where the public library angle comes into that. Because like I invited Sherry and Kate here tonight because they do, they are teachers. They instruct people in this. And that's very important. One of the reasons why I'm also up here talking to y'all tonight is because I get more of the like everyday questions, just like you're talking about. People come to me and say, do you have more information about this, that, or the other thing that they may have read about online or on social media or heard about on TV? And that's why it's so important for library staff members, and we train all of our staff members to do this, to model good information literacy behavior. When we answer somebody's question, we try and be very transparent about where we find the answer and why we believe that it's true. Okay, if you want to fact check, I know you said snoops and political facts. Are there any other sources that uh, you would recommend? Those are the big ones specifically for fact checking. But fact checking isn't just about checking a fact checking website. It's seeing what sites are making what claims. So something, I mean, something like the examples that Sherry was using about like the Springfield incident, for example, that's definitely going to show up in PolitiFact and Snopes. But if it's a smaller thing, like, I don't know, all of a sudden, Ames people starts buzzing about Steve Schenker announcing his retirement. That's not going to show up on Snopes, right? That's something where if I was fact checking it, I'd start looking at the city of Ames website. I'd start looking at the local news organizations, the reliable ones, like the, Trib like the Ames Tribune, and start looking for additional sources to support that claim. And if I couldn't find any, I'd be like, mm, I'm maybe not going to believe that until I see an official announcement. Uh, the ad Fonte site is lovely because it shows bias, how much bias. And it's better to try to get use sources or encourage people to use sources that are more neutral rather than off the bias chart. Absolutely. And if you do a search for just a one particular news organization and look, you will see a bunch of dots that, that line up. And those are different articles that have been checked. And they have multiple people review every article, and they have people from all across the political spectrum. Um, they try to have at least one conservative, liberal, and moderate review each and every article and rate it using a system that they have. I have used factcheck.org. Have you heard of that one? Yes. That's another really good one. One of you mentioned the 501c3. Where do we find out that information about us? If we're looking at something online, where do we find out if they're a 501c3? Okay, excellent question. So um, if an organization is a 501c3, oh, So if an organization, if you're looking at an organization like State's Newsroom and you go to like their about page, they should be upfront about it. Okay. So, um, so it says like right off the bat that there are, that they are a 501c3 right here. 
If an organization doesn't say where they got their funding, that's a big red flag. But if an organization is a 501c3 or the more the related and more political type of nonprofit organization called a 501c4, then they should say so in their about page. Um, if they don't, look for other sources of funding. Are they privately owned? Are they a corporation? Are they publicly traded? Are they getting their funder for, their funding from subscribers or advertisers. The important thing is reliable news organizations are upfront about what, what business model they're using and where their funding is coming from. And really that's true of most organizations, whether it's a news organization or not. If you can't tell where the money's coming from, that's a really big red flag. Does that answer your question? Do we have any other questions this evening? Have you heard of the Iowa Standard? Yes, I have heard of it. Okay. What, how would you describe it? And it says, it's your Iowa news source. We provide you with the latest breaking news and videos straight from the state of Iowa. So that, I will say, is not one of my usual news sources. Mm -hmm. um, However, um, if I if I'm remembering correctly, that one actually does post its ethics, and um, they they are trying to help combat the perception that journalism has right now. Okay, yeah. So, like, if we were to do what I was talking about with this, um, we would just we would start by looking at the their front page like and we can see that they've got a bunch of different articles posted they've got recent dates that's a good that's good then when we look at the article yep we can see a byline that's also good when we start clicking through the different articles that one doesn't have a byline that that's kind of concerning to me that's a red flag um so then we we start looking for their about section i don't see it up here in either of the corners so we're going to go all the way down to the bottom and yep they've gotten about us here but it's not very big one and they're not really linking to anything you said that they do post their ethics? Um, they did have it at one point on there. I'm not really seeing where, and that kind of concerns me. Um, I'd, I'd want to spend a little more time searching around because they can kind of tuck things away sometimes. It makes it a little tricky to find. So not finding it in the first five minutes isn't necessarily a problem. But if I'm searching for 10, 15 minutes and I still can't find it, Huge red flag. Um, I'm not really seeing a whole lot on their contacts page either, where they're outlining who their editors and their their journalists are, and that's that's a kind of a red flag. It's Jacob. Oh, Just they're not Jacob. rated by Jacob. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so I'm seeing a fair number of red flags here. There's a few things that indicate that they might be on the up and up, but if I was looking at the Iowa standard, I probably wouldn't believe it unless I had a source that, that backed it up. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Did you, and did you guys have anything to add? Um, I was just going to add that um, the Capital Dispatch actually is one of the news sources that I use, um, in part because I actually know the person who started it. Um, and she has a long history as a journalist and um, actually was a journalism professor at Iowa State as well. Right. And that's one of the one of the reasons why I pointed out that they had their bylines, because you can see who the journalists are and you can see 
that they have the credentials that they need to be good journalists. That's why it's a green flag. Mm -hmm. When you don't see those kind of bylines, that's why it's a red flag. The only thing that I would add on top of that is the different, we try and break down the different types of authority. So I had, I have a friend who um, was, she had seen a, a thing on Facebook that said certain high schools had put in kitty litter boxes in schools to help accommodate furry students, students who wear costumes that are made of fur. And she was dead set to believe it because one of her friends who had a kid in school had sent a picture of a cat box in the bathroom. And so for that, I would, I would try and caution her about what types of authority there might be in this story. So there's types of authority of, okay, you say you're still removed, one, two, three, four, five, how many of the person who's experiencing it. But there's also the authority of, well, have you asked the administration at that school? Because if that's an actual policy, the authority in charge, the administrators would confirm or deny that. And remember that high schoolers like pranks. So it, when when she approached me with that one, I said, well, you know, I was a teenager once and I remember doing a few dumb things and sending some pictures to my parents and saying, look at this. So you know, types of authority matter. And it's not just the credentialing, it's it's also like positions of power and authority too, so. Yeah, and that's kind of what you were getting at when you were talking about the author of that original study, right? Mm -hmm. Like she does have the authority to talk about sleep disorders in infants. Mm -hmm. The marketing people, didn't no, not, so <laughs> not so much there so yeah <laughs> again that's where that google search yeah. comes in so with your kitty litter example mm -hmm. um what that actually stemmed from it's believed um is that a lot of schools now actually do have in a closet in the classroom they do have buckets of kitty litter mm -hmm. but that is in the event of a school shooting if they have to be in an, an in an extended lockdown. And so people have heard about this and they're trying to give it some kind of greater purpose than what it actually is. So that would be possibly a case of the misinformation where I'm using this sort of factual information for a purpose to distort something, to make you believe something. And again, really emotional pull there like what i'm outraged right now you know or oh i'm disgusted keto litter you so it's yeah thank you thank you thanks all right thank you all for coming this evening i hope to see you all again on october 24th when we learn about political polling um, I'm so glad that you were able to join us for our discussion tonight. Thank you for coming.